Okay. So, uh, good morning. Welcome um, on a presentation about somewhat controversial topic of JavaScript cr cryptography. I'm Krzysztof Kotowicz. Uh, I'm a web security researcher. Uh, in the past, I was researching HTML5 vulnerabilities and uh, browser extension security. Uh, I was a pen tester at Cure 53 company. Now I'm an information security engineer at Google. And this presentation will mostly cover research I was doing uh, while working at Cure 53. Uh, two important disclaimers. The first one is I'm not here to represent Google, so every uh, sentence I'm, I'm telling you is represents my opinions, not, not one of my employers. And there's no, there, there will be no zero days, so every vulnerability uh, discussed here is already fixed or is publicly known already. So uh, maybe uh, let's do a quick uh, show of hands. Who of you thinks that JavaScript cryptography is a good idea? OK, there's a few hands. Who of you thinks that it's a bad idea? Yeah? Well, you can actually Google it pretty easily. It's a terrible idea, at least uh, if you Google it. So there's two prominent blog posts about it from a few years ago. The first one by Thomas Ptaczek entitled JavaScript cryptography considered harmful. Uh, and the second one by Nate Lawson, uh, final post on JavaScript crypto. And if you take a deeper look at, the, at those blog posts and other opinions on JavaScript cryptography are present um, in the, say, security or crypto community, uh, you can derive multiple arguments. Uh, so why is it a bad idea? First, uh, it's not needed. Because in order to do some computations in a web application, do some computations on secrets, let's uh, imagine, I don't know, AES encrypting, uh, you first need to deliver the code to the application, to the client, and only the server delivers the code. So server has the possibility of tampering with the code or backdooring the code itself. So any sort of uh, computation being done client-side implicitly um, well, gives the, the trust to the server. And also, you need an SSL or TLS um, encryption anyway to deliver the code and prevent, it, uh, prevent many of the middle attackers to tamper with the code. So if you already have a secure channel between the server and the browser and you trust the server, why doing the computation on the client in the first place when you have much more control over the environment server side? So it's not needed. Usually. Uh, also, it's dangerous. One of the most prominent things with JavaScript or web security is XSS. So, exploiting an XSS vulnerability basically uh, can backdoor any sort of computation in, done in the same origin. So, it's dangerous. And also, it's hard. So, the JavaScript language itself does not give you much uh, features needed for cryptography, say there's no big integer, the native big integers class. And also the <coughs> quality of the libraries there uh, when the blog posts were announced was pretty poor. So you can imagine that JavaScript crypto is doomed to fail. So developers read the articles, asked about opinions and stopped doing JavaScript crypto and we all lived happily ever after, right? Uh, well, actually that was not the case. Now we have multiple crypto, uh, cryptographic libraries available. Uh, there's uh, crypto primitive libraries, there's some protocol implementations like TLS stack, uh, there's multiple open PGP implementations uh, done in JavaScript, there's uh, user applications built upon those protocols, there's custom crypto protocols, so there's a lot of uh, actual cryptography being done in JavaScript. Uh, from a researcher's point of view, this is an ideal situation because now we can analyze the code that is actually written and look at the vulnerabilities or problems with JavaScript cryptography that uh, are based on real-world scenarios. Uh, this is not a theory. So um, I had taken a look at uh, the, a few of those libraries and I decided to uh, take the following approach. 
first, I would analyze the code of those libraries, find the vulnerabilities that are actually present, not the theoretical ones. For, uh, look at the problems that the crypto is actually facing. Uh, understand the root causes of those vulnerabilities that I found. Try to compare the situation to native crypto libraries. Fix what is fixable or propose fixes and describe the limits of JavaScript cryptography. And this is what the, what the talk is actually about. So if you take a look at cryptography uh, vulnerabilities uh, present in JavaScript libraries, you can divide them into two sort of buckets. The one bucket uh, is, consists of problems that um, are present because of the features or lack of features within the JavaScript as a language. And the second uh, bucket is the problem of basically web platform. So web pl platform gives certain restrictions or um, operates in a certain model that poses problems to um, doing crypto well. So let's take a look at language issues. Uh, but first, uh, do we even care about specific language being used uh, to code uh, cryptographic, uh, say, protocols? Does it even matter? Well, I would say it does. And if you think otherwise, you probably are going to fail. I repeat, you, you are going to fail. Uh, so, yeah, it does matter. Language features can uh, pose problems, real world problems, and uh, there can be vulnerabilities because of that. Uh, so, what is JavaScript as a language? It's a very tricky one. So, it's a dynamic language. It's a language which is weakly typed. It's a language with sort of unusual inheritance model uh, based on prototypes. It's a language with an implicit global object uh, that also poses problems. And the parser is pretty forgiving. So, if you take a look at uh, just a sh short example of, of those problems uh, is that code is actually a valid JavaScript. It's an alert one. Obviously, you can, you can derive all that. This is all being done on like uh, type coercion being done by the, uh, by the language itself. Uh, so you can construct pretty much any code in JavaScript, arbitrary code, uh, in just, by just using six, six characters. This is just an example. Uh, I don't, ah, the slides are not really visible here, but basically, uh, there's a lot of gotchas uh, in JavaScript or quirks uh, resulting from the fact that uh, JavaScript is weakly typed. So uh, this is actually uh, taken from the page called wtfjs.com. And there's multiple issues uh, being described there. So I would encourage you to just go there and check how weird JavaScript can be. So one, of, one kind of a problem. Uh, so the Boolean true value uh, is equal-ish to string true. But if you try to compare false to false, it's actually false. So it's not the same, right? Or, for example, uh, the minimum value is not actually less than the maximum value from, uh, derived from math object. And while null is, um, or type of null is an object, so null is an object, it's not an object. So, yeah, and there's multiple ways of triggering this weird behavior, behavior in JavaScript. As a result, uh, developers actually when coding applications, not only crypto applications, they don't use types in JavaScript in general. Uh, they don't use, for example, instance of. This is very rarely uh, um, appearing in JavaScript code. And this matters to crypto. There can be real vulnerabilities occurring because of that. Uh, and this is one example of, of such a vulnerability. Uh, it was pretty famous, I think, last year or two years ago. So CryptoCut, an application doing encrypted multi-party chat in JavaScript, in, in browser extension, uh, had the problems with the random number generator entropy. So when it, was, uh, when it was generating private key for user, which obviously needs to be secure, uh, it does not, uh, well, it needs to be long enough, the entropy needs to be, needs to be uh, big. Uh, for, uh, from, from which the, the key is generated. So it used the CryptoCut random string library to seemingly 
generate a private key uh, based on 64 random bytes. This is in a comment. But actually, if you take a look at the implementation of the function, uh, it generates a random string of length size, so 64. Uh, but actually, because of the values of the parameters here, it consists only of the decimal digits. So it's 64 decimal digits instead of 64 arbitrary bytes. So the amount of entropy is way less. Uh, and this is all because of weak typing. I mean, if the developer had used like byte array, uh, he probably would, uh, would not have the problem uh, that he was facing now. So because of that, because of this stupid mistake, but again, coming from the lang uh, language features, uh, he lost a lot of entropy. And there, was, there were several other um, issues with the entropy there, and the key was actually uh, brute forceable by uh, certain attackers. Uh, the other thing with JavaScript is magic properties. So again, let's take a look at CryptoCut. Uh, it's a multi-party chat application. And in order to communicate with someone, you need to ex exchange keys and uh, generate a shared, se shared secret. So this is um, a piece of code that, uh, that is run when you receive a communi an initial communication from someone new uh, in the multi-party chat channel. Uh, so it checks whether we already have a public key stored internally in the variable for this particular sender. And uh, if we don't, oh, there's, there's an um, exclamation point here. So if there is no uh, such a key yet, well, uh, just assign the value uh, coming from the, from the wire and generate a shared, shared secret for that, uh, for that, um, for that uh, uh, chat member. And later on, when you decrypt the incoming message from this new uh, or already known uh, sender, uh, you just check whether you have a shared secret already for the sender. And then you compare the HMAX and uh, use AES to decrypt uh, the actual uh, message. And this one is obviously secure. I mean, it looks sane. Maybe apart from this um, comparison of HMAX, which you should do constant time, but that's another problem. Uh, unfortunately, JavaScript has a certain property uh, that allowed the attacker to, uh, to change the logic of the application. So there's a proto uh, property of any uh, JavaScript object. And this one, at least for the, for the usual dictionary, uh, like, uh, like the one used for shared secrets or public keys, uh, resolves to a new object, an empty object. And empty object, uh, it's actually true. It's a truthy value. So public keys, proto. So if there's, there's a sender called proto, uh, let me go back to the slide. If there's a sender called proto, uh, it would resolve to true. So you would never generate a shared secret with someone called proto. And then, if you checked for the shared secret, this would, would resolve to true as well. So you probably have a secret, right? And then you start accessing the secret. Here, shared secret sender HMAC. And this one obviously fails because shared secret proto is just an empty object. So uh, the result of that was whenever someone called proto joined the multi-party chat, he broke the chat for everyone else. <laughs> Again, this is only because uh, of JavaScript feature. Uh, but, this is not unique to JavaScript. Certain languages also have uh, these kind of problems, like Python has uh, magic properties as well. And you can do some attacks or um, influence the logic of the application through magic properties. So this is not really unique to JavaScript. Um, the other thing with JavaScript is silent errors. And this one can be really dangerous. So if you try to uh, construct them, an array and then access an index which is not yet present in, the, in an array, uh, it doesn't throw any error. It just returns undefined, which is better than C because C would basically allow you to, to browse like a memory, uh, memory um, range which is not available for this array. At least it, it wasn't defined there. So uh, 
But the problem is, it just silently returns a value. Uh, and there's a second thing you can combine with that. So uh, this is actually a Unicode character or code point. Uh, so in JavaScript, a string is, does not consist of bytes. It consists of Unicode characters or code points. So uh, a string char code add function returns a value which usually is less than uh, 256, right? But if you supply a Unicode string there, uh, actually the value will be greater than, uh, it wouldn't fit in one byte. So uh, there's a lot of attacks you can do with Unicode on JavaScript libraries, but uh, I would like to describe one attack which is uh, very relevant to crypto. Uh, it's a 16 snowman attack. It's an attack uh, discovered by Daniel Dreschenbacher uh, on the JavaScript AES uh, library implementation. And it uses those two quirks of the language to, uh, to form a really nice attack. Uh, so first, a little bit about AES um, uh, crypto. How does it work? Well, it's a, uh, it's a block cipher, uh, multiple rounds block cipher. So you have a, you have a plain text. Uh, then uh, you uh, perform operations with a key on that plain text. Then there's multiple rounds uh, doing, um, I think it's nine rounds in AES. So uh, there's uh, a few operations being done repeatedly on that plain text. And there's a uh, uh, last round uh, after, after, after all uh, with just mixed column step is, is, is removed from here. But the important thing is, first, after you add the round key, you perform operations uh, on S-Box. S-Box is just 256 hard-coded values for the AES um, cipher. Uh, so you perform, uh, for perform opera operation on plain text with the set S-Box. It happens repeatedly. Uh, and you get the ciphertext. The decryption is in reverse. I, I will just uh, describe the uh, decryption later on. So uh, this is the vulnerability. So if you supply, a, if you supply uh, a plain text which consists of Unicode characters, uh, the sub byte function uh, which accepts a state of the cipher. So this is basically in the first round. It's a, it's a plain text, somehow, somehow modified, but it is a, uh, it is a plain text. And an S-box value. This is, again, 256 uh, hard-coded values. Uh, it tries to find a matching S-box S -box bucket to, uh, to replace the, uh, the state. But actually, this one uh, is not 256 anymore. It does not fit in a byte. So it doesn't find any value in the S-box matching. So this call returns undefined. So after calling this function, you get a state from uh, uh, consisting of high bytes, let's say, or uh, values that don't fit uh, within a one byte, and you replace it with just 200 or 16 bytes undefined values. 16 undefined values. So you lost the first state completely. So you basically kind of bypass the first round of a yes. Uh, but there's interesting thing happening further on. So we have we have a state which is undefined which would probably trigger some uh, tricky things in the JavaScript. Maybe it will throw an error afterwards. But there's another function in AES uh, implementation here which uh, allows us to go back from the undefined to zeros. Uh, this is a mixed column step. And uh, if you take a look, there's just a lot of XOR operations. And in JavaScript, uh, zero XOR undefined is zero, because why not? Uh, so after, after uh, processing this function, after ex executing it, you get an undefined, XOR undefined, XOR zero, XOR zero, which is zero. So you go, so after the first round, uh, after the first round here, before adding the round key, uh, for any arbitrary plain text being done here, like Unicode plain text, you would uh, result in a state being 16, uh, 16 zero bytes. And then there's another round doing uh, processing. Then, but then we get the decryption process. So if you, if you with the library, if you encrypt a Unicode uh, string, you get a ciphertext, which is uh, 
sort of modified because of that query. And then you try to decrypt the same string with the key that you don't have. And uh, all the computations are being done in reverse. So at the last round, you get back the same zeros here. And after that, you call inverse subbytes and add round key. So inverse subbytes basically applies the same transformation as the subbytes function. Uh, it just processes the uh, inverse as box. It's a feature of the, of the crypto uh, cipher here. Uh, so basically, we have a state which is 16 zero bytes. And for every zero byte here, it tries to access the buckets for the Xbox, uh, for the Xbox uh, constants. And it always ends up being the first one, the first bucket, the zero bucket. So you end up with the state being, actually the first value in the inverse Xbox bucket is 52 uh, hexadecimal. So you end up with, uh, with the plain text after all uh, being 052, 052. And after that, you just add the round key. You XOR the, the whole thing. So what you did uh, by decrypting this modified uh, ciphertext is, is you end up with just an AES key, which you shouldn't know, XOR with uh, 0 0.52 bytes. So this is a simple inverse operation. Then you XOR the, uh, XOR the resulting plain text with uh, 52 bytes, and you get the key. This is a beautiful attack coming from just the features of the language. But again, this is not just a JavaScript problem, or this is not a problem that only occurs in JavaScript cryptography. So uh, there's similar things being done, uh, or similar failures uh, being done, for example, in GNU TLS, uh, the vulnerability from this year. So what happened is it's a TLS implementation. So when it verified the certificate uh, of the server, uh, there was this function called check if CA. And this function basically validated uh, whether the certificate is being signed by the trusted issuer. Uh, and if so, it returned, as you can see on the comments, it returns true or false. Well, actually, it returns an integer here. Uh, so uh, in C, there's no exceptions. Uh, so usually, what you do to report errors, you, ret you return negative values. But the color for this function only compared to zero. So whenever you were able, as an attacker, to trigger an error condition, which is pretty easy, you just supply you know, a, a certificate which is invalid in, in a certain way. Uh, this return value uh, started being negative, like minus one. And of course, uh, this uh, bypass this, um, the condition was, wasn't met here. So the abort step in the certificate ver verification wasn't being done because uh, it, it would only fail if the certificate wasn't trusted but there was no error condition in between, like during the verification of the certificate. So again, you return an integer but you treat the value like a Boolean and this is the root cause of this problem. Uh, in uh, C implementation of, of TLS stuff. <coughs> uh, looking back at, at the language issues, they are not unique to JavaScript. Uh, they are present in pretty much any uh, language that you try to implement crypto, uh, uh, cryptography in. But you can overcome them. You can use the ECMAScript 5 strict mode, which uh, disables a lot of quirks of the language. Uh, you can uh, use a sort of JavaScript compiler, uh, like for example, Clojure compiler, which allows you to actually enforce the types being declared uh, during the compilation. So uh, it allows you to implement a strong typing within a language which doesn't support it natively. Uh, also, obviously, the development practices like code reviews, testing, unit testing, integration testing, uh, continuous integration, they also immensely help to produce uh, a code which has less probability of being vulnerable. But the more interesting problems to JavaScript cryptography are actually web platform issues. Because JavaScript is not an abstract language uh, like executing in some uh, mindset, right? It's, it's a very con concrete implementation. JavaScript al always runs 
within a JavaScript engine, and there's multiple engines right now. Uh, that um, language engine runs in an execution environment, like say a browser renderer process or a uh, server process like Node.js, for example. Uh, there's also different APIs available to JavaScript code, like uh, say DOM implementation, if it runs within a browser, Web Crypto for some browsers, a browser extension API, and so on and so on. So there's different things that the JavaScript code can actually call. Uh, also, because of those environmental issues, there's different restrictions being placed upon the, up, upon the execution of the code. Like the most famous one in web is same origin policy. So you shouldn't do things that affect other origins or applications from other origins. There's like a block, uh, uh, block or policy that prevents you from, from uh, affecting other origins. There's content security policy. There's iframe sandboxes, extension security policies. And all those policies actually affect uh, any JavaScript program. And those conditions are actually much more important than uh, the language issues themselves. The first vulnerability type arising from a web platform is obviously cross-site scripting. Well, cross-site scripting is uh, all over the web, and you already know that. I mean, it's all over. Uh, but when thinking about JavaScript cryptography, we need to think of XSS in different mindset. XSS here is basically an equivalent to remote code execution because that is what the attacker is actually doing. He's supplying the code which executes on a client and that code uh, can bypass certain uh, security guarantees uh, coded uh, within a JavaScript application. So what can XSS do for crypto? Well, almost everything. Uh, it can replace a random number generator, a very tricky attack. It can exfiltrate the, exfiltrate the secret key. It can uh, replace the public key uh, in asymmetric cryptography. And obviously, because XSS is such a, say, popular vulnerability, it also uh, is present in uh, cryptographic code. So uh, when I take a took a look at Mailvelope, uh, which is open PGP implementation in the browser or integration. It allows you to use PGP within Gmail interface. And there's usually when you implement something like this, there's a very simple attack which almost always works in the browser again. So you have a public key of someone, of your victim, and you can encrypt any sort of arbitrary message to the victim, right? So you encrypt a message called, uh, with XSS payload basically, HTML uh, message with some JavaScript code. Uh, and what Mailvelope did was, of course, it decrypted the message safely somewhere in the extension code. But then, in order to be user friendly, it embedded the resulting plain text back into Gmail interface. Because ultimately, that's what you want to do. You want to read the email in Gmail interface in, in the UI of Gmail. So through that vulnerability in the extension, of, of obviously it, it used like email HTML assignments to, to achieve that, uh, which is technically a DOM XSS vulnerability. So through exploiting this vulnerability in the extension, the attacker could actually uh, execute arbitrary code in the context of Gmail. So you, I could read any other email, I don't know, set up email forwarding, uh, exfiltrate contacts, whatever. Um, or make a URU dressing attack to kind of enforce the user or convince the user to, to reveal his password, whatever. Uh, but this is not bad enough. I mean, this only allowed the user to exploit the Gmail application. It didn't have access to the private key, for example, because it was separated by same origin policy. It was the, the computation over the, the, crypt, uh, the ciphertext was being done in another context. Uh, so this was an interesting case, but not <coughs> as catastrophic as the next one. So the next one is CryptoCAD. Again, uh, so in order to talk with someone at CryptoCAD, you need a shared room, like a chat room. Um, which is called conversation name, I, I think, in the code. And of course, you need the nickname. 
So CryptoCAD only validated the nickname upon entering it in the user interface. So you could copy the code of CryptoCAD, remove that validation being done, and start a conversation with someone, embedding uh, you know, angle brackets and starting uh, uh, putting JavaScript code in there. And when you start a conversation with someone or join the chat room, uh, the code would be trusted by CryptoCAD extension and uh, just you know, embedded in the DOM of the extension. So what can you do with this? Well, CryptoCAD had two versions uh, uh, of the extension. The one was, uh, one was implemented as a Chrome extension. And in Chrome extensions at that time, uh, there were very well was already content security policy enforcement. So the attacker could not execute, sorry, uh, could not execute JavaScript. But what the attacker could do is to embed any sort of HTML, say, static code. Uh, so potentially you could only do some uh, UI spoofing, maybe um, convincing user to type a password, something like this, like replacing certain messages and so on and so on. So the capabilities of the attacker exploiting that vulnerability in Chrome extension were pretty limited because of uh, content security policy. But in Firefox, uh, the matters are much worse. There wasn't any content security policy present um, at that time at Firefox extensions. And even worse, if you have an XSS in Firefox extension, what you can do is you can execute arbitrary code on the machine as a like, OS user, uh, which I, I can install malware through, the, through that vulnerability by starting a chat with someone using the Firefox extension, uh, Firefox CryptoCAD extension. So you can imagine that XSS here is a pretty big deal. And this is much more uh, destructive vulnerability for JavaScript crypto as well uh, than the language issues like those weak typing, for example. But again, remote code execution is not unique to web platform. I mean, this is a vulnerability that cryptographic applications are facing year after year. For example, this year, uh, you could exploit a, a GNU TLS SSL client. So a server supplied uh, an information uh, to a client or sent certain bytes with a long session ID and triggered a buffer overflow on, uh, on the client side. And of course, there was a possibility of executing arbitrary code. So these kind of vulnerabilities, and I really encourage you to think of XSS in terms of remote code execution, because that's, that's what it is. Uh, these type of vulnerabilities also exist in, in native crypto applications. Uh, other type of issue from coming from web platform, actually present in the, in the code of the applications that I've looked at, is the usage of MathRandom. MathRandom used to be the only uh, random number generator uh, available to JavaScript applications. The problem with MathRandom is that it's not cryptographically safe and you can, you can recover the state in some browsers. Uh, you can even recover the state cross-origin, so by forcing uh, the user to, uh, in, a, in a second tab, if you are able to execute JavaScript code, uh, you can uh, trigger certain conditions which enable you to know this current state of the random number generator, and with that you can, uh, you can predict the computations being done on the se second tab in, in a different origin. Uh, right now, fortunately, uh, this issue is kind of fixed because we do have now in almost all of the browsers uh, a native cryptographically safe uh, pseudo random number generator. It's being done by Web Crypto. So there's this function you can call instead of calling path random. Uh, in Node.js, there's a, a separate function being um, available as well. But, as it turns out, even when there's a code available uh, doing uh, cryptographically safe uh, pure NG, people still, still use MathRandom. For example, 
For example, in OpenPGP.js, this is obviously an OpenPGP implementation in JavaScript. Uh, there was an RSA encryption padding, uh, according, of, of course, to the specs. And um, it used a pseudo-random function here to uh, construct a padding for RSA. And this is uh, actually essential to, to um, RSA uh, security, uh, that the uh, padding being done here is generated or is unpredictable by the attacker. Uh, another thing, CryptoGuard, again, it's my hero. Uh, it's, it's an XMPP <coughs> implementation as well, and it uses a certain protocol uh, called Bosch. And in Bosch protocol, uh, there's a session identifier and, and uh, request identifier. And these are, it is critical to, for them to be unpredictable. Uh, and non-repeating, like a nonce. Uh, but CryptoCAD used a Strophy library. Uh, so again, this is not a vulnerability in the CryptoCAD itself. It's a vulnerability of a de dependency that CryptoCAD relied on, which is an interesting problem to security as well. But technically, through that vulnerability, uh, you could exploit CryptoCAD. So obviously, it used math random function, uh, so even though the safe alternative was already available. But again, is this problem only occur occurring in web? Not at all. Uh, let's take a look at OpenSSL um, Debian fiasco. So in 2006, uh, there was, or, or the case actually occurred in 2008, for, so the problem was present uh, in the wild for two years. So what was the problem? Well, OpenSSL, uh, in order to uh, feed the entropy to the random number generator, it uses multiple sources. And one of those sources uh, is actually reading an uninitialized memory with the assumption that the bytes are, you know, they can be anything, there's no control over it, so it serves uh, the purpose well. But obviously, it's not a good developer practice. So the Debian maintainer for OpenSSL uh, analyzed OpenSSL with Valgrind. It's a tool that checks for memory safety issues. And obviously, there were warnings being triggered because somebody is trying to access uninitialized memory. That's usually a, a, a vulnerability. So it, but he didn't know the code well enough. So he asked the mailing list for OpenSSL developers saying, hey, I'm running this with Valgrind, and these are warnings, what should I do? Maybe I should remove those, you know, code lines triggering. And they said, ah, yeah, possibly, there's no harm here. Uh, so he removed it. And as a result, the only entropy source was actually the process ID, which is way too small for, uh, for seeding a, a random number generator. So SSH Keygen, which used OpenSSL uh, library, on Debian for over two years, it could only generate only 32k uh, possible type keys. So as you could imagine, at 2008, when the issue uh, was made public, pretty much everyone had to replace their private key. It was similar to Heartbeat. Another kind of problems timing side channels. Uh, so the thing is, in crypto, you can derive a lot of information from side channels. So you don't attack the crypto directly. You attack the effects that the crypto triggers. Uh, in JavaScript, uh, it is very easy to, uh, for the attacker to execute code which is pretty close uh, in the execution environment to the application being attacked. You can even enforce the code to be in the same thread uh, via using iframes. And Eduardo Velanaba demonstrated a, an attack using iframes, uh, exploiting timing side channel vulnerability that allowed him to cross domain, brute force a number being used by the, uh, by the crypto code in a, uh, in a certain origin, in, in a different origin by just you know, repeating and measuring timing, um, measuring the timing differences. Timing uh, side channels are present in a real uh, JavaScript application. For example, this one, 
uh, is present in the OpenPGP RSA the encryption of the party. Again, this function should always should be side, side channel free. This is essential to the security of the, of the cycle. Uh, so it should always execute in the same amount of time. Unfortunately, there's multiple return points. Uh, there's the branching being done here. So it's, you can measure differences in time uh, based on different input values of this function. Uh, but this is, again, not something we can demonstrate. Multiple libraries are, uh, or multiple uh, code bases are vulnerable to the same kind of problems. Uh, for example, this year, there was a timing side, side channel in Java Secure Socket extension, uh, which was able to uh, exploit the fact that the TLS stack implemented by uh, JSSE generated a random number only under certain, certain conditions. The conditions were the padding is invalid. And only measuring precisely the time uh, of that, uh, you could uh, construct a successful attack against JSSE. Uh, other kind of problems, not really unique to JavaScript, actually not even coming from, the, from JavaScript, is direct memory access. So I guess you all remember Heartbleed. It was not a crypto vulnerability per se, but through, uh, ex through uh, lack of bounce checking, you were able to extract the memory of, of uh, TLS server. So this allowed you to bypass the encryption promises being done by SSL because you, like, you backdoored the, the whole thing. Uh, Fortunately, JavaScript is a memory safe language. We don't have any, you know, memory initialization thingies. We don't have buffer overflows, so we're good, right? Uh, well, uh, not really. If you take a deeper look at the language, again, it's not an abstract language. It is being run in the JavaScript interpreter or, or compiler or yeah, execution environment. And this one is coded in native say native languages or so, uh, non-JavaScript languages, and these can have buffer overflows. So there were multiple, even this year, there were, there were multiple vulnerabilities in the JavaScript engines that allowed the attackers to execute arbitrary code. Uh, and this was not XSS, this is something deeper. You execute like a native code. Uh, this one was pretty cool. It was uh, found uh, by Geohot. Uh, so what he did is he initialized an array buffer object and redefined the getter for the byte length property of this object. And uh, uh, it was a function which returned a pretty big value. So it's, he simulated, simulated a, a really small array buffer which pretended to be pretty big. And through that, he was able to read and write arbitrary memory areas. Uh, so when you want to do uh, cryptographic computations in JavaScript, the real problem that you are facing is not XSS, because that one is easy to solve uh, if you have the control over the code. Uh, the real problem that you are facing is that the browsers are an attack surface for you as well, because the attacker might exploit the HTML parser, uh, the JavaScript engine, the network stack, and through that, you can, for example, read arbitrary memory areas to, I don't know, extract private keys from your application. And the problem with web here is that pretty much visiting any URL in any sort of tab can potentially execute the code that exploits those vulnerabilities. Uh, so what actually happens when you exploit, a, uh, say, HTML parser vulnerability in a, in a browser? Well, in Firefox, uh, it's kind of game over because Firefox uh, internally it's a single process, so you can uh, you can access the information uh, all over the place. Like there's no you know process boundaries here. In IE, uh, IE Microsoft uses multi-process uh, in interest or implementation, and in Chrome, uh, Google went even farther. So there is a separate process for every tab you are visiting. 
And there's also a sandbox. So whenever somebody exploits a renderer, he still executes code within a sandbox. Uh, so to say, he cannot, without escaping the sandbox, which is a separate vulnerability, uh, without escaping the sandbox, he cannot read the memory from, say, another tab. Uh, so, basically, if you are able to execute arbitrary code, you can think of it as sort of installing a malware on user's computer. Uh, and this is, again, not something unique to web platform. I mean, crypto software was bypassed by simply installing the malware. Like, GnuPG even in the, in the FAQ mentions a case where uh, like the security promises of GNUPG were bypassed by, by the drug, and, uh, drug administration authorities uh, by simply installing a keylogger on, on the victim's computer. Um, so for JS crypto, you need to look at the browser as an equivalent of an operating system uh, for native crypto applications. So browser security in this um, scenario is sort of equivalent to host security. Unfortunately, there's one difference. Mm. And the difference is the application delivery. So in order to run something on your computer natively, like uh, say an application, a desktop application, you need to install it first. There's a certain process and you need to download it of a certain uh, code repository or something. In the browser, you can execute arbitrary code by just visiting the URL. So as you can see, it's much easier to exploit the browser than it is to execute arbitrary code on the machine. So essentially, the web platform is a huge code execution playground running happily any code supplied all through over it. And only same origin policy can sort of isolate the applications. Uh, and the isolation is required for crypto operations, as you can uh, probably imagine. Uh, so is JavaScript crypto doomed then? Uh, because if you create a perfect application, there's no XSS there. Uh, you, uh, you can trust the server uh, to not backdoor the code for you. Uh, you put it on a website, there's TLS with perfect forward secrecy, whatever. And you can still be backdoored by just anyone executing the code in a, in a second tab of, of your victim's computer, right? And exploiting the browser. So how can we fix this problem if it is fixable? Well, only browser extensions can help you here. So browser extensions uh, are usually executed in a separate process, uh, at least for certain browsers, uh, and they have a sort of isolation from other websites. So by moving all your crypto code to browser extension, you can have the sort of isolation as much as you can get that would uh, protect you from exploiting the browser itself. Um, they guarantee a secure signed code delivery uh, because you basically you install an extension. You don't just run it, but this is in the URL. There's a separate storage area and there's way better separation than just same origin policy. Uh, in Chrome, you also get the process isolation. So extensions are guaranteed to run in a, in a separate process. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a perfect solution. And the open problems are, uh, well, your extension needs to somehow usually cooperate with the website, so we need to create an API for that. And this API needs to be secure in order, for example, not to trigger the XSS vulnerability or uh, allow the attacker to, I don't know, uh, replace the key of, uh, by just, I don't know, um, allowing arbitrary website to call uh, functions which should be restricted by the extension. Um, and also, obviously, in Firefox, XSS basically uh, destroys the whole security promises uh, because you can execute arbitrary code there. Um, open problems. Well, we still don't have the mlog equivalent for JavaScript cryptography, so eventually the secrets can be uh, swapped to disk, which is a problem. Uh, we don't have complete co control over the execution environment, so even if you have a constant time code or constant time-ish code in JavaScript, the optimizer of the language can still uh, do magic, uh, and that magic may cause uh, timing side channel to be possible. 
We don't have a secure story yet, though Web Crypto does promise uh, um, interesting um, things here. And also, the real problem is actually that the extension is silently out of late now in the browser. So, theoretically, you have a secure extension in the browser, but somebody forces the uh, producer or the author of the extension to backdoor the code and it's, you get a new version silently, this sort of problem. And we don't yet have a full process isolation, so under certain scenarios you can uh, end up being executing in the, in the same process as the extension. So the summary, JavaScript crypto, looking at the code, is way better than it used to be. There's still uh, a lot of vulnerabilities, but these are, I would say, manageable. Uh, so the JS crypto flows mentioned before, like XSS, these are not real problems. The real problems are the platform issues, especially the, you know, the direct memory access thingy and exploiting the, the whole browser uh, problems. Mm. Yeah, and basically what you can do is move all your crypto code in the extension because executing the code in the website side of uh, uh, JavaScript applications gives you two weak promises. It gives you two weak security guarantees and there's just two large attack surfaces uh, for the uh, available to the attacker. And this is all, so I'm open to questions. Thank you. Well, I'm actually one of the team members of end-to-end, -end, so yes, yes, I have analyzed it. Uh, it's currently an open source, so basically it's an open PGP implementation in JavaScript as a browser, as a Chrome extension. So yes, we, I have analyzed it. Uh, I encourage you all to go ahead and try it. It's under vulnerability rewards program, so if you find any exploitable vulnerability, you can actually earn money of that. Uh, it's all open source, and we really try to make the extension as secure as possible. And we are aware of all the problems with JavaScript crypto, so we kind of learn from others' mistakes. I think it's right to implement some, you know, crypto uh, tools in, in browser IP, not, uh, not, in, not, as, uh, not as extension. Uh, you mean why did we... Oh, because, uh, I mean, that's not the problem that we are trying to solve. I mean, doing that in the browser uh, certainly wouldn't, wouldn't earn a lot of trust in people because Chrome is not open source, right? So there's still a possibility. Uh, it's not auditable. So, and with open sourcing the library, uh, we encourage people to use JavaScript crypto even outside Chrome, outside any sort of uh, our con or Google controlled environment. And actually doing crypto implementation in JavaScript is advancing the, uh, the field, I would say. It's something that we all needed in Google and outside of Google. So that's why we, we have taken this approach. Yeah? Well, yes, uh, unfortunately, they are pretty old and not well ma maintained right now, uh, at least the Stanford one. Uh, so, yes, I am aware that there are implementations of that, and I have no knowledge of any vulnerabilities from that particular pieces of code, but I would say we need a more modern libraries because now JavaScript like gives you the possibility of uh, say typed arrays, byte arrays, and you know web crypto, and that wasn't available at the time when uh, Stanford Library, for example, was created. So, is it possible with current browsers implementation to create an NSA-proof extension for encrypted? Like so <laughs> no, no Google and no like anybody. 
I mean, usually, uh, it's not a, I mean, potentially, it's a philosophical question. I mean, you cannot trust anything, ultimately, because everything can be backdoored, like down to the level of firmware, the CPU, uh, microcode, and so on and so on. So, if NSA or whoever has the capabilities of uh, backdooring something down to the firmware level, well, no browser is going to protect you from that. It's, it's just, uh, you know, it's ultimately a question, a question of how paranoid or how, uh, what kind of mindset do you have? How, what attacker do you want to be protected against or what kinds of attacks? Yeah? I mean, JavaScript is JavaScript, so obviously you don't have the whole web platform issues. Uh, the say, second part of my presentation. You still need to be aware of the weak typing issues of JavaScript, and actually Node.js gives you certain, uh, say, native primitives which you can help you, like it has a TLS stack. So there's a lot of things already being implemented in uh, native languages. Uh, that you don't need to code in JavaScript because they are available. So I haven't looked deeply into Node.js, but I am aware that there's a good work being done on that front. Yeah? Probably again, like you said, it's I haven't been researching Internet Explorer lately, so I wouldn't be able to give you an answer, but I wouldn't expect that to be really uh, possible or feasible. So you are lucky to the extent that you have crypto in JavaScript. Yeah, but web crypto doesn't give you everything. I mean, you still need an application using the web crypto. Yeah, and this is usually the real problem in crypto, right? And, uh, Where do you store the keys and so on and so on. But you think that you have to write a web crypto in a separate memory uh, extension and not administer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, web crypto is thought out as being just an API yeah. available to JavaScript. But yeah, I know that. Yeah, I, I mean, it is a legacy problem, uh, like the uh, problem with legacy applications, and it's software development problem, essentially. Uh, so yes, we have certain features in modern browsers that allow us to finally have something much more safe or secure, but you have older browsers, and you just, if the uh, browser vendor doesn't support the users, like stops updating the, the browser, stops adding new features to it, well, there's only so much you can do. So. Thank you.